uh, this is going to be the story, as well as I can remember, of my service in the armed forces. My name is Vincent Joseph Oliverio. I was born in Salamanca, New York in 1923. I received a letter from the Army saying that I was inducted into the service. The letter came probably in January of 1943, and I had to report with a bunch of other people from Salamanca to the post office in Salamanca. I think it was February the 10th. We loaded on a couple of buses, and we either went to Buffalo or Niagara Falls. I know eventually we, la or we were in Niagara Falls, so we'll say we went to Niagara Falls, and we all got a physical, which was really nothing much of a physical because they needed men so badly that uh, if you were just warm enough, they would let you go through, sent you home, and they let you stay home, I think it was 10 days, to wind up all your affairs, do whatever you have to do, then get go back to the post office, onto the bus, and then definitely we went to Niagara Falls and the old fort over there in Niagara Falls in the New York side. And there they measured you, they give you the clothing, and uh, more or less give you some idea of what you were going to do, this or that. Then they sent, everybody went, or almost everybody as far as I know, went to Atlantic City. And uh, there they, we were all set up in some huge, big arena like a basketball court or something. And there they sectioned everybody off, section A, B, C, D. and. From there, they decided where they needed the men, where the men were qualified, and where they were supposed to go, be sent. And before that, you had filled out a paper, what your occupation was, uh, what you were good at, what you excelled in, anything that give them some idea of where they could put you. Well, for me, all I did was uh, bartender, manager of the hotel, that type of work, and uh, musician, I played the violin and the mandolin, and that's all I had in my report. The next thing I knew, they were calling out names. Uh, uh, Jones, John Jones, report section C. Tom Jones, report to... Everybody was going here, there, and they finally called my name. And they sent me to a section. And after I got there, they said, well, all you guys in this section are going into radio school. And I questioned, radio school? I didn't put anything down in my resume, radio school. And they said, well, that's what they say, that's where you're going to go. So, well, the radio school was, I was going to become a code operator. And it was going to be a 20-week course. And it was a very extensive course. You woke up in the morning, you had your breakfast, and you went down to the classroom, and you were like in a little cubicle, like a phone booth. And they put the earphones on, and they would, somebody would, in the earphones would click, 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 and they would say, hey, remember that now, remember that. And uh, then eventually they gave us a diagram that you would look at, like A was da-da, and on the phone to come on your speaker, da-da, that's A, da-da, A, B, look at your chart, B, da 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 B, da 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 C, da 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 Da, 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 C, all the way through the entire alphabet, even to the numbers, like number one. Da, 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 by heart just as well as if I had gone to school yesterday. Well, anyway, it was so intensive of a course, and with those earphones on constantly, except when you, you quit for a little bathroom break or something, or for the noon hour lunch, you were on there eight hours with us thing constantly in your ear. And I, we remember one guy went absolutely nuts. He just went, he just went crazy, wacky. He tore the earphones off, and he was running up and down the the rows. I don't know what ever happened to him, but he just lost his marbles. It was just too much all day long. Some people could never hack it. They just couldn't stand that all day long. Da 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 da. Well, 
come to find out uh, why did they pick me to go to the cold school on account of the rhythm. And when you are a musician, you know there's a rhythm that you do when you're a musician. Everything is this sort of a time, that sort of a time, and it helps you with the code, which was the truth. It really blended right in, and you could do just so nice the fluid motion. So anyway, I don't know what happened. I was so darn good at it that instead of 20 weeks, in 10 weeks I'd passed the course. When you pass the course, you're supposed to get corporal stripes. But they said, no, we can't give it to you. Even though you passed the test, you have to sit out the whole complete 20 weeks. So there I stayed there, and I still kept mucking around, practicing, played around with it. Well, I really became good enough that they wanted to keep me there as an instructor to instruct the new recruits coming in. But no, I was a smarty, and I didn't want to leave my, my friends people from Salamanca that were somewhere in the outfit, I figured, well, I'm all going to stay together, we're all going to be together. Well, anyway, a 20-week course, the 20 weeks ended up, they gave me my corporal stripes. Next day, they put me on a train <laughs> and sent me off by myself to Florida. <laughs> no buddies, no nothing. <laughs> like a darn fool, I could have stayed right there and, and spent the whole war just doing the did all. <laughs> all day long. So anyway, I got down to Florida in the middle of the night, two, three o'clock in the morning, whatever it was, in the big, huge barracks area. I don't know where I was going actually. They told me, go to uh, bar crack, barrack C in Section 8, whatever. So I saw a guard over there and I said, where do I go? Where is this place at? Uh, he says, go in that tent over there and if there's an empty cot, put your stuff on it and go to sleep. Okay, I stumbled in there, I found an empty cot. I laid down, threw my blanket over me, and it seemed like I just fell asleep and da 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 That means get up, quick. You got five minutes to get up, get dressed, and go outside and stand for formation. And there they would call your name out. Like say they would say Oliverio and you would answer, Vincent J Do, John, Fury, you know. So this thing, this Trump, and I was just sleeping so beautifully there. And the guy next to me said, hey, buddy, get up. you got to get outside for Reveille. I says, yeah, okay, all right. Come on, get up, get up. You're going to get in trouble. No, I didn't get up. What the heck? I don't know anybody there. Nobody knows me. Who am I going to answer to? <laughs> Within about half hour, an hour or so, somebody came in. He said, what's your name? I told him. He says, report to company commander in so-and-so to go over there. So, okay, I went to where he told me, and it was a sergeant there. He was with a, a rebel. The, we used to call them rednecks because they hated the Yankees. They hated anybody from up north. They were still fighting the Civil War. And he says, what's your name? I says, Corporal Oliverio. What do you mean, Corporal Oliverio? Where are your stripes? And I said, I just got him yesterday the day before. And he says, around here, you want to keep those stripes? You put them on. <laughs> You want to be the corporal? You show your corporal. Now get those stripes on. He says, hey, all right, sir. Okay. And he said, when anybody tells you that you have to get up in the morning for Reveille, you go. Down in here, you obey orders. That's what you're here for, to obey orders. And he says, furthermore, starting tomorrow, you go to the kitchen. You're on kitchen duty. He says, okay. Well, before we go any further, I forgot to say that after uh, we left uh, Fort Dix, Fort Mammoth it was, where I had my code training, we went to Atlantic City, and uh, there we exercised in the sand. They made us march all over the beach, up and down, up and down, with the packs on our back. We were still not issued any guns or anything like that. Just put the packs on our back, and then every so often they'd have put your gas mask on and walk and back and forth. It was pretty hard walking in the sand. Sometimes it'd be nice and hard, a lot of times it'd be very soft. And there they didn't have any place to put the soldiers and they put them up in those beautiful fancy hotels. Marble floors, marble pillars, marble steps, everything was really class. But they covered everything over with plywood, 
and all the, the stairs were all covered with wood. You didn't know that you were in a classy place unless you looked up in the ceiling. You could see the chandeliers and how nice it was. So we did, we stayed there for quite a little bit. I can't remember how long, maybe a bit, a month maybe. And that's then from there, then we Shanghai down to the, uh, Florida. And the sergeant told me, next day, report to the kitchen. So okay, the next day I went out of the kitchen. And uh, the guy in charge of the kitchen was a very nice fellow. He said, what are you doing here? And I showed him my corporal stripe because I had sewed him on, but I didn't want to lose him. So, and he said, you're a corporal. He says, corporals can't perform kitchen duty. He says, it's, a, it's the rules. We don't, if you're a T5, which is corporal stripes with a T underneath, it means you're a technical corporal. And there, they can make you do the work. But for a corporal, it's a little higher uh, status. And I wasn't supposed to do anything like that. So I said, well, he told me to stay here. Okay, do whatever you want. I walked around, figuring I could do help here, do there, I forget what it was. Then it came time that they were feeding the troops coming in for lunch, dinner, but not lunch. And I figured, well, I better help them out, uh, deal out the mashed potatoes or the gravy or something, I forget what it was. And as the guys were going through, there was a special part on your dish where you put that stuff in, a little bit of dab of this, dab of that. And as they went by, they kept doing that. I looked down the aisle, and here comes my old friend, John Martino, that I was in radio school with. He didn't see me. He was talking with the guy ahead of him or behind him, and he was passing the, his tray around, slowly edging towards me. When he got to me, I took whatever I had. I put it on his beans, on his carrots, on his squash, everything he had. I loaded that crap on there, and he said, what the heck? Are you look up, oh, geez, out of area, out of area. He, he was so happy to see me, and I was happy to see him, finally a, a, a friendly face. So. After that, we got together and we had a lot of fun. I finished my KP duty. And uh, then from then on, though, I always seemed to have trouble with the rebels. Everybody that was in charge in that camp seemed like they hated the northerners. Yeah, it just seems like all of the sergeants in charge, not the officers, the ones that had the bars on their shoulder, but the ones that were uh, sergeants and master sergeants or who were in charge, they seemed to have it in for the people from the north. So anyway, I supposedly had done some infraction, whatever it was, I don't even know what happened. They called me out and they said report to the garbage detail. Well, everybody was getting their chance that you have to work the whole day for the garbage detail. So okay, I went on there and I met the couple couple of guys that were on there too and it was a lawful dirty stinking messy job. You'd go to the kitchen and you'd empty, empty, up, empty all the grease pits, all the cooking that they did all day long. Stuff would filter down in what they call the grease pits. You'd have to get them all out, scrape all the grease off them, put them in bags or garbage, whatever it was, and get rid of them. And then go around certain places and pick up the garbage and put it in the trucks. That was a tough job. I figured, well, okay, by gosh, the next day, Oliverio, yep, report to the garbage detail. What the heck? Garbage detail again? You're only supposed to get it once. Report to the garbage detail. Who do I meet on the garbage detail? But one of the guys that was on yesterday, a guy from New York. He was from Hell's Kitchen. A real tough Hell's Kitchen. He grew up where you had a fight when you were 12 years old or, or somebody would kill you on the streets. He was just a regular tough New York guy. from the, When they say Hell's Kitchen, that was the part that was bad. He, You had to fight, you had to belong to a gang, and he was that type of guy. So we got along right off the bat. Even the first day that I, I met him, we got along. So the second day, he looked at me and said, what the heck is going on? It's two days in a row, garbage detail. And we had a sergeant that was in charge there, and some old dumb redneck, I don't know where he was from. And he always liked to pick on, there were three of us, but he seemed to pick on this guy and me. Maybe we were Italians or something, I don't know what. But he always wanted to get the pressure on, go here, do this, do that, you're doing it wrong. Okay, we stuck it out. Third day came, Oliverio, garbage detail. Oh, who ordered that? Sergeant, whatever it was, the same guy, wants me on the garbage detail again. I'm there, I report. 
a new kid, and there was this guy from Hell's Kitchen, the two of us. Oh, by that time, he's, he's mad. I'm mad too, but not as mad as him. So I says, how are we ever going to get out of this thing? He says, we're not going to put up with it anymore. This is it. This is the end right now. The minute we get a chance to get him behind a building, I'm going to get my knife out, and I'm going to go after him. And I'm going to go after him seriously. Now, you have to fight to hold me back. I'm not going to stab him or anything, but I'm going to be so close that you got to really fight to get me off. Eventually, I'll back off. But in the meantime, I want him to die. Okay. We got around the corner of the building. We we're there, standing around. The sergeant comes out. All right, you guys, what's going on? Bingo, like a flash. This guy from House Kitchen grabs him by the, th by this collar, shoves him back up against the wall, pulls out his knife, and he says, "You son of a." He says, you're not going to get me again. He says, you're going to get it, and you're going to get it now, and nobody's going to know a damn thing about it. I reached over and grabbed his arm. He said, let me go. Let me go. I want to stick the snack. Get him and go. I'll go ahead and give it to him. And he was grabbing him by the throat and pushing his head up against it. And pretty soon the guy was turning pale. Within a few minutes, he'd have probably fainted. Really, he was that scared. And this guy kept going with a knife. Come on. Get me. Get me. Let me at him. Just let me get him. Finally, I pulled him off. I said, no, don't. You'll get us in trouble. You don't want to kill him. Who's going to see us? Nobody's going to see us. We'll put him in one of these damn garbage cans. No, you can't do that. Come on. Give him a break. Don't do it. The guy said, please, no more. Honest. I, I, I won't call you again. Finally, I pulled him off, and he was still raging. This guy from Hell's Kitchen. Let me at him. Come on. Come down. Come down. Well, we didn't even finish that day. We didn't finish the day. We walked off of there. He got two more men to replace us. They never called us back for the garbage detail. Never, never, never. This guy, I think he probably went home and shit his pants. <laughs> but that wasn't, that was just one of the things how they hated us. And uh, naturally, everybody tried to goof off because they would put you on these forced marches. You'd get up in the morning, have your breakfast, get your pack on. This time, then they would have the gas mask. And you would go for maybe, say, 20 miles, forced march. Halfway through, somebody would holler, gas, gas. You'd have to quickly put on your gas mask and then keep marching. And it was tough. So there were a few times that I tried to get away. You know, I'd, they'd have a roll call. Every morning, Reveille roll call. Oliverio, Vincent J. Da, 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 John Doe. So a buddy of mine said, hey, look, it. when he calls Vincent Olive Oliverio, answer for me, will you? He said, yeah, no problem, go right ahead. <laughs> Oliverio, look at Vincent Jay. He got read off the big list in the meantime, I go back into the sack. <laughs> well, uh, this was the one time they caught me. It was, it was a legitimate thing. They really caught me. I was in the sack. So the guy got me. I had to go report. I reported there. And I forget, this wasn't one of those redneck sergeant, but he was, he he just wanted to give the punishment. But he says, Oliverio, yeah, go down to the supply room, get yourself a wheelbarrow and a shovel and a rake. And you go down to the end of the barracks, about a quarter of a mile down there. See that pile of dirt? There's, there's a pile of dirt way down over there. Pick it up, fill up that wheelbarrow, and start marching all the way up the, the whole barracks roadway, anytime you find a hole, you fill it up with the stones and the gravel. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> there I was, all day long, shoveling and shoveling. <laughs> and then another time, they called me, they called me to report to the, to the office again. For what? Because you missed roll call. I, no, I was there. This time I was legitimately there. And again, they said, no, you were not there. Yes, I was. I'm telling you, I went on the march. No, you were not there. Get over there and get that wheelbarrow and the shovel. <laughs> and again, I had to do the whole damn thing again. But that was all right. Then, this one time, this really redneck sergeant, he had the people all around him. We were outside in the field, and he was teaching us combat, like hand to hand combat, and what to do when somebody goes after you. So, the first thing he did was he called a guy, hey, you, come up here. The recruit go up there in the middle, and the sergeant would spin him around, and he points his finger, puts it right up against the guy's back. And he says, "See that? That's how you march somebody." He said, "Now you do that to me." So the recruit went behind the sergeant, and he pushed his 
finger behind the guy's back. March. The root says, go ahead, march. Bingo, the guy spun it right around, grabbed this root crits, the, the recruit's hand and twisted it. He said, say, never safe. You've got to learn to do to defend yourself. So he did a few more tricks and pretty soon, Oliverio, no, you, come up here, I'm me. I said, oh, yeah, well, that's like that. All right, march me, he said, march me. So instead of marching with my right hand with a pistol, I marched with, I put my left hand behind his back and I pushed him with my left hand figure and I held the pistol by my side and he spun around and I went, bam! <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> I could have killed him. I wouldn't have hurt him as much. Everybody laughed until he looked around, he looked at him, they all quieted down. Oh gosh, I forget what the punishment he gave me, but I'll tell you, he was the maddest and everybody was laughing, you know. But it's one of those things, you just, no matter what you did right, it was wrong. <laughs> he marched me over there. And then, it was about that time that I was never as yet issued anything. No rifle, no Tommy gun, no carbine, no nothing. So finally they were going to go out into the fields, firing range, and they had the rifles there. Well, I was always a good shot when I was young. I was hunting all the time. I could shoot anything, any place. And then it dawned on me, I said, if I get to be good with a rifle, where do you think I'm going to go? Probably the infantry department. And I didn't want to go in the infantry department. So I laid down in the prone position over there, load the gun up and everything. And the guide would tell me, now aim at the target, now uh, get the bead on there and put it in the V and then pull the trigger. So bingo, I would shoot the dirt in front of him and I would shoot up into the sky, I would shoot on the left. And the guy kept trying to tell me time and time again, no, you're holding the rifle, you're, you're pulling the trigger, you're doing this wrong. Well, I knew what I was doing wrong, but I didn't want to <laughs> Finally, he got disgusted. Well, anyway, that was the end of that. And when it came time for them to issue the, the guns, they gave me a Tommy gun, <laughs> a Thompson submachine gun so I could spray people or something. <laughs> I was happy with that anyway, see, you know. But anyway, we stayed there and we marched and trained. And uh, we didn't do any code practice. It was more or less marching, marching, marching. Kind of built up your strength. And uh, I, I never had any problem with that. And uh, we stayed there. We stayed there right till, I think it was in October of 1943. And uh, then we shipped up north. We shipped up, oh, I can't remember now. Let me see. I think we went from Camp uh, Patrick Henry. That was up on uh, probably the, the coastlines, Virginia. Maryland. Yeah, I was in Florida lacking just a little bit of being eight months and uh, it was October the 9th, 1943. I was with the 761st Signal Air Warning Battalion and uh, we went to Cap Patrick Henry and it was uh, there they put us in a place I think it was Newport News, Virginia. I'm not exactly sure where. In October 13th, 1943, we sailed from there, from Newport News, on the Liberty Boat. The Liberty Boat was called the Henry W. Longfellow. And we were in a big, huge convoy, big ship, over 90 ship convoy. And uh, the very first hour that I got on that boat, and uh, it started to just up and down, up and down, and I started to get sick. By the time we left that next morning, or that night late, I forget what it was, I started to get sick. And I was sick three solid days on there. And the very first day that I was sick, and I was huddled up against one part of the upper part of the deck, cold, miserable, sick, and on the loudspeaker, Corporal Oliverio report to the mess kitchen. Corporal Oliveri report to the mess kitchen. I wouldn't care what happened. Mess kitchen didn't bother me at all. I was so sick. And one of my buddies came around. Hey, Vance, they're calling you. Go around the kitchen. I said, the hell with them. Let them take the kitchen and shove it up there. You know what? I'm not getting out of here. I don't want to move. All day long, I stayed right there, except going to the railing and throwing up, throwing up. 
and then I'd crawl downstairs and get into my the bunk. It was a bunk. It was a piece of canvas stretched out in a with, with pipe all the way around to hold it up. And you just about had head clearance, and there was the guy ahead of you on top. I think it was about four, at least four or five, four anyway, that you would crawl in. And I'd go in there and lay down, hopefully that I didn't get too sick. And if I felt sick, I'd have to run right quick to the latrine and try to throw up and come back. On the second day, I was like that sick bad. Couldn't eat, couldn't do nothing but throw up. And uh, Dale Cauldron, one of my, the guy that, eventually was our cook. He came over and he bought me a piece of fruit. I forget it was an orange or an apple or something like that. And I was able to just kind of smell it and bite into just a little teeny bit. And the third day then I started to feel a little bit better. So when I did feel better, I think it was probably the third day or maybe the fourth. Anyway, I can remember the first time I went down to the kitchen to eat and they give you a tray and they put this over here on this little part of the tray and that over there. So I got the tray and I went down in there, the mess kitchen, and they threw that stuff on my tray and I went up up top deck to huddle down someplace and eat. And I looked down, it was supposed to be oatmeal. I looked down, what the heck, my eyes are bad or something, what is it? The damn oatmeal was crawling. You could look in there and there was little things moving around, and bugs and worms or whatever was in the oatmeal. Oh, gee. Right to the railing, tray and all, right over to the ocean, <laughs> and I was sick again. It was it was a while though before I really got back to normal, and uh, the storm was so bad that at one time you could you would be up so high in the swell that you and the the propeller even come out of the water like you you just have sounding noise and the whole ship would shake, the propeller would go. <laughs> And you could see every ship in the convoy, not every ship, but you could see, you could tell, and no matter where you looked, it was ship, 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 ship. And then you down, you'd go down into the bottom of that swell, and all around you was 20 feet or more of water. You were that deep down in there, in one of those valleys, and then you'd go up again, and then down again. <laughs> well, anyway, we could only go as fast as the slowest boat and ours was one of the slowest boats. The Liberty boats could only go, go about 10 knots an hour, something like that. And it was all a zigzag pattern, zigzag pattern. And as far as escorts that we had, the only thing that I knew is that we had what they called the sub-chasers, and they weren't too awful big. They were supposed to be faster, and they would be cruising all over, checking for subs on their sonars. And they had what these baby flat carriers, and I believe they were made from old freighters and they would put a deck on them, a big flat deck so the planes could take off on that deck. They only probably had a handful of planes, not like a regular aircraft carrier that had hundreds of planes or more. These only had a few, but it was enough that probably could it deter or help protect the, the convoy. So we sailed and sailed. Finally, now here we left October the 13th, 1943. And we arrived in Iran, Algeria on the 15th of November. One month and two days we arrived in Iran. That's how long it took to go over the Atlantic Ocean. That's a long time to be out on the sea. So anyway, over there they put us in uh, barracks, tents. We had tents. That's what it was. No, no barracks. Actually, we were only supposed to be there a very short time and then ship out to another destination. Well, it was cold in November. I don't care. Africa is cold. At night, you're freezing to death. So there was a tent, no bunks, no mats, no cots, nothing. You lay on the floor. You got your shelter half, your blanket, your raincoat, whatever you have. You put it down and you try to huddle up as warm as you can and you go to sleep. Well, within about five, six days, nobody was moving. We were still there, seven days, eight days. Everybody was catching colds, coughing and sneezing, coughing. Finally, after so many really got sick and cold like that, and we were not going any place, they sent a bunch of us guys went down with the truck down to the uh, docks where they had everything stored over their supplies and came back with a bunch of cots, those folded cots. 
So at least that was a little bit better anyway. And there we stayed. We weren't moving. And uh, what apparently was that there was so much activity in the Mediterranean with the German submarines and whatever it was that they didn't think it was safe for us to go there. I didn't know where we was going to go. I thought I was going to go to Italy because I knew a little bit of Italian. And they figured, well, maybe I, I could, they could use me to, as an interpreter or something like that. So I, I was kind of glad that it could happen, maybe find some old relatives or something over there. Anyway, we kept staying over there, and then they put us on duty. Near where we was at, they had a huge, big amount of empty tents for other troops that would be coming in, that they needed the troops, the space. And they would give you a rifle and some bullets and a flashlight and I forget what else they give you and take you out with a truck or the jeep, jeep, and there they was. You had to watch these whole tents for the Arabs not to steal them. How about yourself? You're supposed to walk all this huge big tent area, dark except for the sun or the stars and the moon. And there you are all by yourself like a sitting duck. Well, come to find out, they were... I was attached, I was sent to guard this one area, and a friend of mine was sent to guard another area. It was like a little valley. I could look down and down the valley, and up on the other side, he was uh, supposed to be guarding those tents. And uh, you get that for about two, three, four days. You're stuck with it. And he, I said, you know what, I'm scared to death. These Arabs are killers out here. They'll steal everything. You can't hang your clothes out at night. In the morning, they're gone. The Arabs come around in the middle of the night with no guards, even if they're guards. They're fast and slick enough. They'll steal anything. And they want you to protect these darn tents in the middle of the night. So he had the place that the road went by his place first. Well, what we used to have was like a long tube, a pipe, with a light in it. And you could send signals with a light. You'd have to train it, get everything spotted up, set up your scope and everything. And it was trained on him. He was maybe half a mile away, a quarter of a mile away, or something like that. But it was enough that I could look in, into where that tube of his was, and I could see that light, little, little flicker. And he would go flicker one, did did did, did 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 did. So we had the signal that once he spotted anybody, or if I spotted anybody, whoever spotted anybody coming up the trail to inspect you, because he used to have a sneak surprise attacks, not attacks, but inspection on you to see if you're on duty. Okay, bingo, next thing I look and there's that light, somebody coming, okay. There was the Jeep trail coming up the road like this, so I hid, I hid like that, there was this Jeep, quietly coming out like that, very quietly. Stop, Rachel! Stop! It's Officer So-and-So. Get out of the car! <laughs> Get out of the car! Put the headlights on! Get out of the car! This is Officer So-and-So. Get out of the car! <laughs> oh, I made such a beautiful impression. I received a little few claps on the back and everything. Doing a good job, soldier. <laughs> but that was one of those things you watch, because I was scared. I'm telling you, when I say I was scared, I would get in one of those tents and I'd make sure that nothing could run and I'd be just as quiet as could be. They could come and take them all. I don't care. <laughs> Nobody's going to sneak up on me. But anyway, that's how we got along with guys like that. It was, it was fun. And then came the time, they, everybody get all loaded up, get your barracks back, go down to the dock, two or three o'clock in the morning, get on board the ship. We got on board the ship, stayed there two or three hours, unload, back to the barracks again you go. Wait two or three more days, okay, two or three o'clock in the morning, everything done at night, seems. Bingo, back down to the docks again, get out of the boat, getting ready to go, get all settled down, two or three hours went by, okay, back to the barracks again. On the third time, I think we finally made it. We got onto the boat, and there we loaded, we were on a British cruiser, regular, regular uh, liner, and uh, we left there in January, I don't remember the exact date, it was almost about the January the 1st, something like that, uh, not much later than, than the 1st of January 2nd, in 1944. We left Iran, Algeria, 
on the British ship Aranda, A-R-O-N-D-A, Aranda. And there we went on to the Mediterranean. I figured, well, good, I'm going to go to Italy. No sooner did we get into the Mediterranean and we looked up in the sky and there was a German spotter plane. It wasn't a bomber. It was a, like a, what they called us, we used to call him a spotter plane. And he took off. We figured, oh boy, he's going to alert somebody. And within about maybe, say, half hour, 45 minutes, two planes came, two fighter planes came. The first one came, about half hour later, another one came, another half hour, 45 minutes, an hour, another one came, one went back. And all the way through the Mediterranean till we hit the Suez Canal, we had fighter escort. But that's all we had. We didn't have anybody else. We, we were sitting ducks, a cruiser. What are you going to do with it? They could, they, could, they could sink you with a rifle, you know. And there we hit the Suez Canal, went right down to Suez, the Red Sea, all the way through there. And we went into the west coast of India, Bombay. We landed in Bombay. And uh, uh, we arrived in Bombay sometime in February. Our troop ship arrived at Bombay, and for some reason or other they were uh, given special permits for some of the troops to go into the city of Bombay. And I was lucky enough to be in one of the groups, and in my group there were four of us. It was me, uh, John Martino, uh, I think it was Ray Rivers, um, there were one other guy, I think it could have been Longwell. I'm not certain, but there were four of us. Anyway, when we got off and we went into Bombay, they had taken us right into the center of Bombay. And there you could see every kind of soldier in the world. You could see French soldiers, American soldiers, British soldiers. Every, everybody was there. And they had the military police, too. They had, uh, the, for the military priests, we'll say, from the Great Britain, ours, the Navy. They had the Navy. Uh, guys that were supposed to be the police and the Navy troops. Everybody was there. It was a nice, bustling, bustling place. So we figured, now what are we going to do? Well, naturally, young, we approached one of these guys that had one of these little wagons. They called him a Gary. It was a horse-drawn vehicle with a place for two people to sit. And uh, we said, we'd like to go dance, drink, girls. Ah, girls, yeah, yeah, girls. Micho, Micho, girl, get in. So we got two of these Garys, Martino and I in one, in Rivers, and I think Longwell in the other one. And away we started to go, click, cluck, cluck, cluck. And there were, like I say, troops all over the place, busy, busy little place. Next thing I know, there weren't that many soldiers around, there weren't that many MPs around, and then streets were getting narrower. Finally, after quite a ways, we noticed no more troops, no more white people, nothing but just plain Indians. And the road was getting a little narrower, very little traffic. After quite a little while, it seemed that he finally stopped. And as we were, before he stopped, we were going down the street, and it was not too wide of a street. There was a little narrow gauge tracks in the middle of the street, and you looked up on both sides, and there were two-story brick buildings, old-looking brick buildings with bars on them. And you look closely, and there were girls, and they were screaming, yelling on both sides, screaming. We don't think they were going on. This guy stopped. So he said, uh, rupees, how many rupees? Well, we had settled on a price, like we'll say, a hundred rupees to take us to where the dancing was, and the girls, and the drinks. All of a sudden, he said, no, no, no. He doubled the amount. And as he was talking, arguing, we were arguing. Pretty soon, natives started showing her up, listening to what was going on. No white person around, not a one. And the girls there, you could see them hollering and screaming, what's going on? And the guy said, our driver, girls, you likey, you buy. You likey, you buy girls, girls. And we said, we don't want to buy girls. We don't want to buy girls. You likey, you buy. He kept insisting that we buy one of the girls. This was, afterwards we found out, a slave market, an old slave market that nobody's supposed to know anything about. So I knew we were in a lot of trouble right there. And I talked to my buddy Martino in Italian. 
I said, I don't know what tech to do. What are we going to do? We're getting surrounded by these natives, and there are only four of us. I look, and down the road comes this little narrow gauge trolley train. Just a little one, a few cars, a couple of cars on it or something like that. And he was coming along at a fairly good speed, not too fast. So I said to John in Italian, you go to the other two guys and tell them, the minute that train gets fairly close, let's bust our way out of these guys and head for the trolley. And before we got on there, I had bought myself a little souvenir whip, a short whip, maybe say three foot long whip, not a big long one, short whip, like more or less like a, uh, in case I needed it for something, whatever it was. So anyway, here comes this trolley. I looked and I said, this is a pretty good time. So I swung that whip around like that. These guys broke loose and away we went, the four of us running for the trolley. I was in better shape of all of them. Bingo, I was first on the trolley. I got on, Rivers got on, Longo got on, and old roly-poly John Martino. He was kind of short, about five, seven, eight, about 200 pounds, and he was huffing behind the train. <laughs> just reaching out, he was only about three, four inches away. Just couldn't quite seem to get it. I forget, uh, Martino and I, or not Martino, Rivers and I reached over, finally grabbed hold of his hand, and we yanked him onto the trolley. So when we got on, we looked and River sat over here, Longwell sat over here, Martino over there. There was only one seat here or there. So I happened to sit down to right next to a very well dressed businessman it looked like. Very well dressed. I didn't say a word. And the conductor came by and he wanted uh, what the fare was. Well we didn't have any money like that. So I forget whether I gave him an American coin or a dollar bill. I can't remember what I gave him, really, because the fare, I think at that time I found it was only about five cents. So anyway, the conductor left, and I sat there, mind my own business, and this well-dressed man said to me, he said, you do not belong here. You don't belong here. No, come back. I said, I'm sorry. He said, we don't know where we're going. The guy took us here, thinking that we thought he was going to go to a place where I have dancing and everything. He said, you know, come back. You know, belong here. I says, okay. I apologized. Very quiet. And finally we went, and the train kept moving the trolley, and we were getting close to where we could see uh, American soldiers and MPs. So we got off. And I can't remember now if we did ever get into a beer garden or not. But eventually we went back to the ship, and uh, overnight we all stayed there. The next morning, Everybody, all the troops got off of the ship, and we boarded a narrow gauge uh, train and narrow gauge uh, tracks and heading east. We didn't know where we were going. And the train was really a rough looking thing. The, there were no cushion seats, benches on both sides, and you sit down there or you lay down there. And every so often they would stop at station. This was an Indian train. And they were taking our troops, and I don't know what other kind of troops, and they were also taking passengers from Indian passengers. And I remember the very first place that we stopped, there were Indian peddlers trying to sell you some kind of fruit, drinks and stuff, and we were warned, do not buy anything whatsoever from the natives, because you don't know how sterilized it is. What they, they, don't buy anything, you're going to get violently sick. And do not give any money to the beggars. Okay. Next thing you know, we stop at next station. There's some old little boy all crippled up, and the mother there all dressed up in rags. Bakshis, bakshis. That means alms. Give me alms. Bakshis, bakshis. And you're almost tempted to reach in and throw a dollar or two at him. You know? And this British officer was going up and down the train, inside the train. Do not give these people any money. But, sir, look at those people, they're so poor, look at them all crippled up, his leg all twisted up, or his in a crutch or braces. And he said, they purposely maim the child, because they know that they get sympathy from the tourists and peddlers or whoever comes around, they get sympathy, and that's how they make their money. They purposely cripple the poor children. See? So from then on, you looked at it, you still wanted to do something, but then you realize, anyway, I forget how many days it took, we went from the west coast of India, Bombay, all the way to a huge big river on the east coast. Later I found out it was the Brahmaputra. It's similar to our Mississippi River, huge. There were some 
places where you can hardly see across to the other side. There they put us on flat bottom boats, like a ferry boats. There was no upper deck, no bottom deck, unless they put supplies or something in the bottom deck. And this was probably, the boat was probably no more than 25, 30 feet wide and about 50, 60 feet long. Nothing fancy at all. And uh, with that, there were two of, two of the boats. I remember the two of them. Ours was called the Buzzard. And so, next thing you know, where we're going north. We're going north to North India. And uh, so, every so often, every about four hours, five hours, we would stop and they would, uh, the boat would dock. Everybody get off. And the British controlled all of India and Burma and everything. So we'd get off and the British had lunch or supper or dinner ready for us over there on the on the shore. And most of the time it was, all, it was mutton, mutton, mutton. No matter what time of the day, mutton was part of the meal. So then you had to be careful. We didn't realize it. There was a big, huge buzzards flying around. And there were Indians, regular Indian, uh, what they call them, the coolies or servants, with big, long, 20, 30 foot bamboo poles with the flags on them up at the top. And they was going like that. And asked one of the guys, what, what's this for? He says, those buzzers will come right down and take the food right off of your mess kit. If these are, oh, come on, give me a break, you know. Boy, oh boy, I, you don't know how many people lost their food by just hold it just a little ways away from their body and before you know about it just like a bullet they would come down whoosh, and grab whatever was on your plate and go up and there these natives were like that see to us it was fascinating made it uh, amazing but for the in english that were there they, they, they were teed off you know <laughs> there's, there's nothing to laugh about this anyway we would make those stops at night though we'd go back onto the ferry boat he dock and we would spread out on the deck with your uh, shelter half and blankets and your bed roll and, and you'd sleep on there. It was warm. And uh, then there were times, there's, I remember, I can't remember the first day or the second day, we were going up to Brahmaputra and somebody spotted something exciting on the, on the shore, whether it was camels or animals or whatever it was. And everybody ran and go down that shore, around that side of the boat, to look towards the shore. And the captain of the boat was screaming his head off, no, 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 you're going to tip over the boat. Everybody was going to once. And it was true, before you knew about it, we were almost into the water. So from then on, we separated. So anyway, this kept up for, I don't know, two, maybe three days at the most. And we arrived, and uh, I think the place was called Dinjan. And that was going to be our first headquarters. We all got off of these ferry boats. And there we had uh, different types of uh, barracks. They were not really barracks. They were tents, big tents. Some of them had wooden sides on them. And they would sleep probably six or eight to a tent. And uh, so we got all situated. After we got settled into the, this new type of barracks that we had with the tents and the wood. And then they uh, put me into the radio shack and I was working with the radar. At that area around there, there were enough flat areas that they could use the radar. In the mountains, the radar is no good because it shoots a direct signal and the direct signal comes back. But there was a radar, they had a radar unit maybe a mile or so away and uh, they ran the wire from there to this radio shack and next to me was the guy working with the radar and he had the earphones on and listening to what the radar guy was telling him and as he gave him the position of any planes, friendly or enemy, the guy would write it down on a tablet, regular form that we had and I would look at it and I would send it on the key da, 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 da. and the way it worked is that they would say uh, like a bi-motor. If they knew it was a, uh, a single motor, it would say single motor, bi-motor, two motors, or multi-motor. And then they would give uh, friendly or enemy or unknown. Our planes, they used to give out a signal that our radar would pick up and know that they were friendly. Sometimes maybe it wouldn't work, so it would be an unknown. 
the enemy, they would just more or less know that it didn't respond to any signal that they would classify it as enemy. Or the radar could pick it up and define what it was on the screen that it was not one of ours. So anyway, the, the guy would write it down, we'll say, one single engine, uh, altitude, we'll say 8,000, north going northwest, and the time, like 10.02. He put that down and I would go, ta-da-da-da-da-da, I would send identically what he put down, 10.02. Then it'd be quiet, nothing happened, they'd follow that plane. and. Within about another 30 seconds, a minute, the guy would write down the same thing, single motor, da da da, altitude 9,000 feet, northeast, going northwest, change directions. And, and in order to make sure that it was the same plane he was following, I would put down RE-1002. So whoever looked at that form would know that that's the same plane that we had plotted just a, a half a minute or a minute ago. So you can keep track of that plane. Every time I follow that plane, I put down RE-1002, RE-1002, until we lost sight of them. So this was the very first day, and everybody told me that don't worry about anything. We're in a safe location over here. They have never had an attack. They've had bombings nearby, 50, 100 miles away, an occasional plane come over there. But don't worry about anything over there. This is a pretty safe location. Okay, before I know about it, looked on the plot, there was six unknowns, so many altitude, we'll say eight, ten thousand, whatever it was, I don't remember, quite a ways away, coming more or less towards this way here, and the time, and I kept doing that, six more over here, eight more over there, four over here, six more, and they seemed like they were all heading towards our direction. And I know that about 40, 60 miles, I would think west of us, there was a big supply base, a big supply base. And everybody figured, I wonder if they're heading over there. Who is it? Could it be? It can't be ours. Next thing you know, altogether there was, I would say, 30 or more that I was plotting. Next thing I know, I could hear the anti-aircraft guns going off. Next you could hear way the distance bombs that they were bombing places coming in. Pretty soon the ground started to shake and I looked at my buddy, he looked at me and I figured, hey, let's get the heck out of here, you know, they're getting pretty darn close. So we put down, he put down the earphones, I put down, the way we went outside to the foxhole and we jumped in the foxhole. We weren't there, I don't think, 30 seconds and some officer come right out. Corporal Oliverio, Corporal Smith, get your ass back on that damn radio. But sir, the plane's the bomb. Never mind, get your ass back on that radio. <laughs> so we went, scared to death, got my helmet, I put it down over my ears <laughs> to protect myself. I got on the radio, did it, did it, did it, did it. And next thing I knew, I looked, oh my gosh, they sent paratroopers. Looked out the window, there was all these oriental riflemen, soldiers, and I said to my buddy, oh my God, we're being attacked. We got to burn up all the codes, get rid of all of them. No, he said, those are Chinese troops. The minute there's any danger whatsoever, they have to protect the radio station because here we have all the sensitive codes that if they ever get a hold of this, they can't send anything until they duplicate all the codes again or get all new codes. So it didn't seem like it took very long, but you could hear the planes the whine of the planes, and the guns going off, tum, tum, tum. Well, like I say, it seemed like uh, an hour, but it was probably nothing, the time element. Finally, everything was all cleared, all quit. And afterwards, we found out that out of the 32, I think it was, enemy planes that was heading towards this way here, we knocked down 28 of them. And that was because they were clever enough to have little airstrips all over, separated like 20, 30, 40, 100 miles apart. Five, six planes here, five, six planes way down south, five over to the east, five or six over to the west. So wherever any danger came, they would alert those planes that were the closest and they would send up for intercept. And actually the minute they got that, they were way ahead of the enemy, way up higher. So they were like, uh, the enemy coming in was sitting ducks especially just bombers, 
course, they had their own fighter uh, escorts too. But anyway, it was a big celebration. They're like, and we lost uh, two planes and one pilot. Uh, the two planes were down. One of the pilots ejected, was saved. One pilot went down with the plane. So that was a beautiful thing over there. So from there, they realized that in order to get some of the information that they wanted to this nearest airstrip, they had to go about 25 miles on an old road that made a big, huge semicircle. And I forget, one of them had the idea that if we go through the jungles, it's only about four or five miles. Let's cut a jeep trail, a little enough to put a trucks or jeep through there. Oh, that's a good idea. Save 25 miles of terrible road all the way going around. Okay, now we've got to find a volunteer. Who wants a volunteer to help build a road? Yeah, I'll volunteer. I don't care. So, okay, he gave me, I think, five or six natives. The guy, the interpreter, explained to the natives what had to be done and to obey my orders. And everything was done by sign language. And, uh, okay, so the natives all had their hatchets and they had the big swords like a machetes. So I had my Tommy gun, and the way we went, followed the, which way we were going to go, get the compass, get the directions, how we were going to make the road. And we started chopping down. Most of it was bamboo trees. Around here, nobody realized how big a bamboo tree is, but they can grow to be 50, 60 foot tall, huge bamboos. Maybe about uh, diameter, probably seven, eight inches in diameter, huge things. So anyway, we were chopping away, and I was having them fill in the gullies a little bit, depressions to make the road smooth and put it in dirt. And they were hacking away, and, and uh, I was just there following them. After a couple hours, three hours or so, I got tired. I was just hanging out in my big old time again and watching them work. I always felt pretty active and everything. So I told one of the leader, the leader there, that me, I pointed to myself with the knife, give me the machete, and chop, chop. Okay, he agreed, yeah. So I give him my Tommy gun to hold, and he put it on, naturally, proud as could be, you know. And I grabbed that big old machete, and I was away chopping away the bushes and doing a good job, you know. Don't do them, you know. But then about 15, 20 minutes, this guy grabbed me by my shoulder, and he pulled me back. Well, he couldn't speak my language. I couldn't speak his language. And he said, but he kept pointing and making a motion. I looked, nothing but jungle. A jungle is a jungle, nothing but green. It's either going out of the ground or it's going up and coming back down again. You don't see anything but green. And he kept pointing. So I stood there, you know, and he quit pulling me back. And I figured, what the heck is he looking at? I kept looking. Absolutely nothing. Nothing but green. So I took another step and I grabbed my machete and I started to go whacking away. Again, he pulled me back and he really, he was really screaming. Ah, give me, give me. What in the heck's the matter? Then he made a, a motion that was going up and down, undulating, undulating, whatever, undulating motion going up and down like waves. I forget. Oh my gosh, that's a snake. And I kept looking. No way, no way could I see a snake. So he took the machete out of my hand and very slowly, one foot ahead of the other, next thing I knew, he raised it up and whoosh, big swipe, down come about a two foot piece of snake. The rest was still up, up into the tree. Later I found out it was a deadly green tree snake. From then on, I was all the way in the back. No more machete, no more leading the parade. And uh, so anyway, I, we, I didn't quite finish the road at that time. I finished probably about three-quarters of us, then I was sent out because I had to go up into the hills.